hey, this is Gavin. I am attempting to do a conversation with Jason Delport. Um, Jason and I have, <laughs> we, we've been waking up and speaking with each other for um, since January of this year. Uh, it's now December, so almost a year of waking up every Friday uh, for me um, at about 4 a.m. So right now it's 4.44 a.m. and we've been talking for an hour about the project that we're working on and we've never really um, dedicated any time to just getting to know each other and that's kind of speaks toward who we are but um, I think there's other people who might enjoy getting to know for example who Jason is so I wanted to take this time to to do that so uh, what are you doing Jason what is it that that occupies most of your time right now um you mean other than you <laughs> <laughs> um yeah so um would you like me to speak about myself right now um well, as, rather than yeah, do, you, do the paul van der clay sort of version of uh well, how, how i got here first um well, I, i'm cool with either well i would like to say like uh yeah i kind of want to start at like i think that the projects that that we work on um they are and the things that we do day to day kind of speak to where we're at now and i tend to think the things that we've done previously they're they're interesting and useful um but i'd like to be able to connect that with where you're at now and so you know the, it's like for example like how do you how do you make money nowadays like a that's that's that'd be like a first just simple question okay like what, right. are you, so, what are you what are you and what do you would you call what would you say you're an expert at what is it that you've been spending most of your time doing for most of your life um well uh, don't go there because i've i've i'm uh, uh I, i've done so many different things in my life um so at the moment and for the last eight years i've um so I live in Tasmania, which is a small island state south of the mainland Australia. Um, and I moved here in, in 2005 from South Africa. And that's just to, because um, I do not have an Australian accent. So that's just to set that scene. Um, and for the last eight to nine years, I've um, been a refrigeration mechanic. Uh, so I, I um, have done some commercial work, but the majority of my work is, um, is essentially um, servicing, maintaining, and installing uh, domestic um, air conditioning systems, which we call in Tasmania, we call them heat pumps because uh, for 95% of the time, we use them in what is called reverse cycle mode, um, so we're pumping heat <laughs> from the outside into the house. Um, so so uh, we don't use them as air conditioners primarily. We we have there's a valve in the unit which allows us to uh, flip the two boxes around as to which is the hot box and which is the cold box. So we, it's a uh, very efficient. It's the most efficient way of heating homes uh, in Tasmania, where um, our, you know labor is quite expensive. Um, you can get wood for free, but you have to sort of pay yourself at market rates to go and harvest timber. Um, and uh, so the, the market has figured out that these are the cheap, this is the cheapest form of heating. So what, what's, um, what's funny is that our brains are very similar. And I, I feel like we're, we like things. And so you're, you're explaining, you're explaining uh, heat pumps and the environment that you're in. And I know that's, that's connected to the project that we're working on. Um, and I know, but I know that there's some people who are interested in like your relationships as well. So like, you know, are you a husband? Are you a father? Um, what's that, you know, how, yeah. Um, what, like how many people have you worked with and, and, and uh, how big of yeah, a sure. team have you worked with? So I'm interested in those things as well. So what are your relationships? <clears throat> okay. So I, I'm, I'm a, um, uh, I describe myself as a um, an introvert in the sense that I um, I have a I'm comfortable with a very small group of 
friends and colleagues. And I, I'm actually a, um, I trained and I worked for, for set eight years as a mechanical engineer, initially in project engineering. And I specifically left that because I, I disliked large project environments. I felt out of my comfort zone and I, I left. I extricated myself from that position. Um, so the company I work for here is a very small company. Um, I, until recently, there were two refrigeration mechanics. The company has recently changed ownership. Um, uh, the 30-something bloke that I worked with um, sadly left um, uh, to um, pursue um, extra training opportunities uh, with a bigger company. Um, so I'm I'm now it in terms of the main refrigeration work. There are other contractors that assist with installation work, but I now do all the refrigeration work. So, and I love it because I'm out and about by myself, um, inter interacting with customers. I'm not scared of talking to people. I just am selective about who I talk to. Um, that's probably the best way of describing my introvertedness. I'm I'm really interested in engaging with people, but. But what interests me is, you know, it might be 5% of the people out there are interested in this, similar things to what I am, so. Okay, and uh, let's see. And so the ones that for me is like, I'm a, like, I have a real, I try to have a relationship with God. I'm trying to be a good husband. I'm trying to be a good father. So, you know, what about- um, oh, the, my, God, my family what, side. Yeah, yeah. What about these things as well. Uh, I'm curious yeah, yeah. About All right. So, um, the uh, so I'm 57. Um, my children are all adults now, but I have three three children, um, and they've all left home. Um, so it's myself and my wife rattling around in the large family home, um, and the cat. Um, and, and we live on a nice, quiet little cul-de-sac street. We have one neighbor and, you know, that goes with what I just said, the kind of person that I am. It, yeah, you're, you've got a cat. Is this the, I've learned something new now. I didn't know you yeah. had a cat. Yep. And, and um, I, I was the instigator of us getting the cat because I was the one who, ban who banned the family from having cats. And until I realized I was being until I relented because I kept getting these appeals from my children. So eventually I relented and for my sins, this cat has now chosen me as its favorite person. Um, so there you go. This is, uh, this is the, the punishment I, I've received. Um, uh, uh, yeah, anyway, so enough about the cat. Um, <laughs> I, think it's funny. I, think, I think that there's probably people who would have, um, they would love to hear about your cat and your relationship uh -huh. with your cat. So. Uh, but yeah, that's good. So you, but um, yeah. In, in, so in terms of my um, um, spiritual life, I'm, um, yeah. It's it's a question. How much time have you got? So I'll, yeah. Uh, so I, I think I think as I'll I'll just tell you. So originally, I, I grew up nominally Christian, um, and. Uh, uh, became a obnoxious young teenage atheist, loudmouth lout, um, and then sort of during my university course, I um, did a course in astronomy, and I realised that the world was a very big place, and I didn't know very much about it. So I um, shut my lips and became slightly more humble, and um, and then things happened in life where I got humbled even further, and it was. So that happened in my 30s and it was during that time where um, I had a series of what I call Jungian synchronicities which opened me up to the possibility that the physicalist description of the world um, couldn't explain what I experienced um, and that opened up to the road now where I describe myself as a um, non-practicing Christian, non-practicing in the sense that I do not attend any church, but I'm, I've been a follower of Paul van der Klee, um, since 2017, I believe. So, yeah, the, it seems like 
when I listen to the conversations uh, that Paul does, it seems like a lot of people, they find their way. So we found our way um, to each other where we're working on this project um, and you were working on it long before me. You, I think you said it's part of your life and your, your history. The, but yeah, you, you found, we found our way to each other and, it, and it, everybody kind of connects it all back to eventually like a Jordan Peterson and Paul Vanderclay. Correct, yeah. So Peterson was, um, I found him first and very, and not long after that, uh, I uh, found Paul Vanderclay. And, and that's where I've been ever since. Is, did the, so the Christianity, did it, did it be, like, was it a, something you were um, believing uh, before you listened to Jordan Peterson and Paul Vanderclay, or is it something that came after that? No, no. So my, um, my, the reason why I found Peterson was um, one of his, uh, I forget whether it was personality or psychology, what his maps of meaning course where he um, did a section on Jung and the algorithm I was doing searches on Jungian synchronicity so I was sort of um, I mean I had a strong sense that it likely was um, biblical experience I was having but I was resisting this heavily um, and um, so, so I was following the psychological uh, because I, I'd been exposed to Jung's ideas um, through a friend back in university. So I was aware of the collective, uh, the, the concepts of the collective unconscious um, and Jungian synchronicities, and that there was supposedly a way where um, we subconsciously can be channeled a, a, uh, through to real physical events so in, in such a manner that our mental state coincides with a with uh, reality, uh, set, set unrelated reality in the world, and that the two things occur at the same time, and and then become meaningful and lead to a sort of spiritual change. So that it was that, but I had multiple of these, and that's what had confused. You know, just I couldn't let it go, and so it kept nagging away at me. And it, it was deeply intertwined with this project that I'm on. This project essentially had a um, sort of a scientific slash engineering component and had a spiritual component. So the spiritual component led to the engineering side being manifest. And that was all it was just happened, it just sort of bubbled up um, into my awareness. Uh, but, but it was being cued by literate, by totally unrelated um, events in, in, in the real world. And that just it kept happening. And it just, I had to make sense of it. Okay. So that's how, I, that's how I got Peters to Peterson. Um, and then, of course, he had to go and do those biblical lectures, which then um, then meant that I had to then uh, contend with what I'd been sort of trying to avoid, which is, um, now that it's, it's intriguing why that is, why one so naturally wants to resist the Christian viewpoint. There's something about it, because once you acknowledge that, you know you have to change your life. Um, and it's the, I think it's that part which one subconsciously just fights and fights until you eventually, you, you can't avoid it anymore because no other answers make sense. And, that, and that's, yeah, that's sort of where I'm at. Yeah, that's interesting. So it's like, um, yeah, I, I was, a, I encountered Carl Jung um, because my mama, as I called her, uh, but a grandmother, she she had a books. Um, she died of Alzheimer's, but uh, one of her books that I somehow ended up with was a book uh, by Carl Jung, and so I I read that and was interested in it. And so I'm aware of these words you're talking about. And so synchronicity is it's one of these things where um, it's actually probably would be the uh, one of the more interesting things to talk about whenever. Um, you're hearing about someone else's story. Um, so I'm, I, I think I want to dig into that some more. But the, yeah, it's interesting that you were aware of these synchronicities and it brought you to Jordan Peterson and then the biblical series, which to me, I, 
it's it's hard to call it a series just because it's it's all Genesis right now. And which sure. is it's also interesting that an exploration an exploration of Genesis has has led people toward Christianity because you know Christianity has something to do with the New Testament, um, but Genesis has something to do with an Old Testament. And so like the 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 leap from Genesis to Christianity is doesn't make as much sense to me. But but yeah, it's it seems like um, like we're together and I'm enjoying it and I'm enjoying our relationship and I it, it we have a, it seems like we have a meaningful relationship and so it's I think it's good but it is interesting that that leap from Genesis to Christianity do do you want to talk about that more like how like you so you watched you I guess you got new eyes listening to Jordan Peterson talk about Genesis and then somehow that led you to Christianity yeah sure because I mean obviously the um the new testament is essentially described as the as a revelation of the old testament and it's it's all one story um and it is the and there's a lot in the old testament that like doesn't seem relevant uh and i can't explain to you why a lot of those sort of stories wouldn't be relevant uh, i mean i could do it if if you, if you had hours and hours of listening to me waffling and, and and, and try, try, you know, trying to land, trying to land land the, the plane, but I mean, essentially the. So can I ask you some more simple questions? Sure. So, how much of the Bible had you read before you listened to Jordan Peterson go through Genesis? Uh, that's like a good, I think, a good first question because I, I remember you saying that you were you were raised um, in a kind of a Christian home. Is that what you had said earlier? Um, no. So my um, so. I, I went, I was raised in a farm um, and um, went to a local school, which was a very small Afrikaner community. Now, the Afrikaner culture was a sort of very Calvinistic uh, Dutch Reformed. Um, the Dutch Reformed Church was the official church of South Africa. Um, this is the apartheid South Africa. And actually, the, um, the official church had um had theologically approved the concept of separate development uh, which was what apartheid means it means separateness so so the philosophy of, of apartheid was separate development of the different cultural uh, groups um yeah what was unfair about it is that the white south africans grabbed all the good stuff and you know and, and then the bits that they didn't want they said all right you know, those parts that we don't want that happened to fall in your traditional tribal lands, you can keep those. Um, but, but we need you for labor, so we will permit you to come and work for us, but uh, we won't allow you to own property, uh, et cetera. You know, so it was a totally unjust system, but the, the Dutch Reformed Church initially, or, or for the great period of apartheid, had actually endorsed this system as being publicly approved. Um, and they rescinded that right near the end, um, but, but before Mandela was released, um, they they uh, changed their their mind. Um, so I was I grew up in this. So the the church was a very big part of Afrikaner culture, and I went to a tiny little school um, where the um, so fifty kids from. Um, grades uh, one to grade seven um, and so and we had a big class of in my cohort was 13, 13 pupils in in in, uh, in my grade um, and there were some classes with just two children in a grade so yeah that, that was the sort of environment that I went to um, I, I was an entirely Afrikaans person I spoke English only to my mother um, and everything the rest of my life was in a, in a different, I spoke up the clients. Um, why, why did you speak English to your mother? Because she was English speaking. So my father, uh, who's, who's name, who was, who was called Jack by everybody. His given names were Johannes Jakubas, uh, which is John Jacob, but in, in sort of Dutch, um, the Dutch versions of John and Jacob. Um, and his, cousin and best friend was Jakobus Johannes, just the same names, just in a different order. Um, and okay. um, 
So, but my father's parents were what they called um, Anglophiles. They were Afrikaners who loved the English culture or appreciated okay. the English culture, but both of them were very Afrikaans. Okay. Um, and because of that, my father was, it was culturally acceptable for my father to, uh, or not, it, it was acceptable by his parents for him to um, marry an English speak, an English woman who could speak barely any Afrikaans. You know, she, she sort of spoke pidgin Afrikaans. She Is could that, barely make herself understood in the early days. Was that strange for, um, for, for, for people from like different cultures and different languages uh, to, to marry like that? Um, it wasn't, it was um, somewhat unusual, but it, it, it happened enough for it not to be looked at strangely or anything like that. Okay. Um, they, if I'd been English in that school, I would have been bullied. And, and my okay. sons, my, my elder son was bullied in that. I, he went to the same primary school I, I went to. Um, and he was, the school by then had grown to 200 children and he, he, he was bullied. Because it's, uh, there's an, um, so there's deep antipathy between um, sort of um, cultural Afrikaners. Uh, so these are, people are very proud of their history and the past, and they have a deep resentment of the British for what happened during the, the Anglo-Boer Wars, where um, the British Empire basically stamped, just, just came and took the country away from them okay. and, and um, herded, I don't know, 50,000, 100,000 women and children into concentration camps and tens of thousands died of dysentery. Um, so this was, a, that's the only way they could win the war because the Boers were winning the war. It was guerrilla warfare and they were being resupplied from farmhouses. So the British then rounded up all the women and children who were left on the farms to basically starve the Boers um, and, and beat them into submission by basically holding their women and children ransom. Um, so, so the Afrikaners loathed or hated the English for doing that. And they actually cited um, there was a strong Afrikaner sympathy with uh, Nazi Germany during the um, Second World War because the Germans were the enemy, the enemy of the British. Yeah. 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 I yeah. think I understand that. I, I don't, I have my, like, I find some of that interesting and, and relate to it and could explore it more, but I want to try to keep it connected to. Sure, sure. Jordan Peterson a little bit. So you had said that the that like there was a this Christian culture or a Dutch Reformed Church culture, and so like what is what does that mean? Like what did like okay so kind so of the background of your upbringing or something? Yeah, yeah, sure. So at school, um, there'd be um, there'd be a sort of an assembly every day. There'd be um, reading from the Bible. There'd be singing of hymns. There'd be prayers every day. Um, okay. so, so it was very and, and that interestingly enough carried through to my high school which was in the big city in an English speaking thing when I, I was ultimately a prefect and part of my duties was possibly once every two weeks is I would have to uh, go up on the stage in front of 650 kids and do a bible reading um, that was one of the duties of being a prefect in in uh, grade 12 um, yeah so so, so, like so I, yeah you had been so, so I had that culture, you know, it, it, so it was a school culture, but um, my mom was quite religious, but she kept it very private. I was aware of it, but she would go to church, um, but, but she didn't take me to uh, the children to church. Like, so have you ever been to church? I had been with her a couple of times. A couple of times. But, okay. but I was bored out of my skull. I would. I didn't know why I was there, and and, um, and intriguingly, my best friend in the primary school. Um, so I was a sort of the top student and the top athlete, you know, out of this group of thirteen. Um, and then when I was in grade five, a new boy arrived, and um, he was the son of the local Dutch reform preacher, who, you know, so there'd been a change in pastor. Uh, 
the local church and um, and uh, this new kid arrived and then he promptly uh, bested me academically and sportingly um, and uh, he is now a Dutch reform minister I actually met, I went to South Africa I met with him two years ago uh, for the first time um, I'd we'd actually uh, encountered each other a couple of times in high school um, just playing sports against each other in the opposing schools but um, we the minute we left primary school and I became more English and he became more Afrikaans, we, we just almost like we had nothing in common. And it was great catching up with him um, that's a, uh, as an adult. Yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> you, keep, you say these little things and I, I want to go back and ask more questions yeah, yeah, sure. later. But it, it's funny, the, uh, the, one of the ideas, depending on whether I was like an atheist or not, I could say something like, you, get, you were programmed with, this, uh, with Christianity and, you know, if I was an atheist, I would call it like malware, you know, but, yep. uh, yeah. you, you got programmed with Christianity. Uh, yeah. So, so, I'll, I'll, so I was given, so when we left this primary school to go uh, to, to high school and um, there was no high school in that local community. So everyone was leaving. Um, and the, the, uh, <laughs> the school purchased and, and gave us an, a, calligraphied personalized Bible to each of the school leavers. And mine was the only English. For some reason, well, they knew I was going to an English high school. So I was given an English Bible. Everyone else got an Afrikaans Bible. Um, and I still have that Bible. And I took it with me to boarding school um, because I went to, uh, yeah, it was an hour's drive away in, in Cape Town. And um, so I, I became a boarder where, um, so, so, you'd get to go home twice in a term uh, the rest of the time you were uh, you're in jail yeah. so i took this bible with me and um i i attempted to um now for the first time by myself because up until then this the stuff was all happening you know spoon fed to you by the school and you just attended you know you had to be there so you you did it, uh, you, you, you participated in the sense that you were there. Um, so I attempted to read the Bible and pray. And I did this a month, six weeks, I forget. And um, I put the Bible away and that was that. Um, that was, it, was, it, was a me, it was meaningless to me. I didn't know why I was doing it. Right, and that was in high school? That was in high school. and. Okay. Um, and during that time, I read the thing that turned me into an atheist was this uh, American author called James Missioner. He, he, the, yeah, thousand page books. And he'd do um, sort of fictionalized um, history of different countries. So he's, he's written a story. So he's an American author. So he's, he's, um, he's I've read so the, the first book of his that I read was on the history of Hawaii. Um, and he starts with the, it's very interesting. He, he describes the geological formation first. So he goes right back into sort of geological deep history, describes how the, you know, the islands were formed as we think it might have happened and so on. And, and then the arrival of the first islander people there and, and so on, you know, so he writes all these stories and then, and then the uh, arrival of the missionaries from continental US onto Hawaii. And, and I still remember this character's name. So this, mis this fictional missionary was called Abner Hale. And he was a vile little man. Um, and the description of what the, um, the missionary, uh, of what the introduction of Christianity and the moralizing that it brought onto the that Pacific Islander culture and how it destroyed them in terms of how it wrecked the, the functional culture. Um, I read this, and this is all fiction, but it, it caught my goat up to such an extent that I, it, to me, it was all real. It was true. This is how it yeah. happened, and I became resentful of of christianity because it took wow. a functional culture and destroyed it and now into that, into alcohol abuse you know the whole thing just now the, the culture fell apart the christians might call that the malware right 
yeah <laughs> yeah yeah sure yeah. so so i was influenced by a book of a work of fiction right um, that's interesting yeah and um it was yeah i can look back now and laugh but gee was i and and then i you know then i started um from you know hearing about the um the catholic systems of uh i uh, forget what it was called where you could pay for your where you could pay um, indulgences up front and then commit the sin so that they could fund new churches. So they were basically saying, yeah, you, you pay us, you go and sin and, and, yeah. and we'll put the money in our coffers. And I started re- you know, hearing about all these things and then it just made me even angrier. The, um, so, it's, a, yeah. it's a interesting, there's an interesting backdrop uh, with the Dutch Reformed Church um, and this idea that they supported um, this this way of of treat, treating different people and private property it seemed did that ever like do you think that that had an impact on you at that time like did you see the church itself as kind of being immoral or unjust at that time uh yes yes um not for, you know, only when i got to high school um when my uh, when i became english and my eyes have opened you know and and i and i judged the culture from which i come from which i grew up in an africana culture and um the the atheism um or my rejection of god and christianity made me reject the culture from which i came which was deeply steeped in in its uh christian um you know it basically used the bible to justify their their um uh what's the word ownership or 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 possession of of southern of the land of southern africa Um, it's like a classism was in place right like a hierarchy of like where one people was a of a better or higher class than another people and it was based on like culture or skin color or would you say yeah yeah, and and it it wasn't just one culture better than another culture that as you entirely correct it was multi-layered so the the African culture under the apartheid system was considered the the bottom rung, and then you had the, um, the the coloured folk who weren't classified as white; they were classified as coloured, and they were the descendants of interracial um, um, relationships. And the original Aboriginals who were down, um, so the, the uh, People were referred to as the uh, koi, hot, uh, and another term for them are hottentots. They no longer exist, but they were sort of related to. I don't know if you've heard of the koi sand or the bushmen. Um, that they are still um, Aboriginal people who live uh, a fairly traditional. Not all of them, but some of them still live in the Kalahari in a very traditional manner. And there was this famous movie called The Gods Must Be Crazy, which was a South African flick, which took the world by storm. And this Bushman guy was literally plucked out of his Aboriginal lifestyle and became a rock star in Japan. This movie really took off in Japan. Um, and um, so, and uh, I won't go on, but the, the colored folk were the, um, considered to be the descendants of the Hottentot folk who were affiliated to the Bushmen, but the Bushmen tended to live in, had been chased by the um, African tribes uh, into uh, the sort of semi-arid desert areas uh, where the Africans didn't want to be. And, and that's where they learned to adapt and, uh, and survive. And they were very good at that. But the, the Hottentot folk who were in the Cape Town area and along the coastal regions around there, they all got um, wiped out by white man's disease. But inbreeding had happened and their genetic material is believed to be part of what was called the colored community. So sorry, I'm rambling here about things which may be of no interest yeah. to any of your listeners. Well, but um, Yeah, the, the, I think the point that I'm curious about is there's, a, yeah, there's this Christianity as a backdrop and you know, and, the, and its relationship with a system that essentially, it seems like it oppressed some people more so than other people. And then there's, and the question would be is like, you know, how, 
your perception of that Christianity, like how was that influenced? And there's other deeper questions there too. That, okay. but, but, but yeah, I, I'm yeah. wondering if this, if this, how much this played into your percept, your, your atheism, for example. Yeah. Yeah. So look, um, for those that may, may be interested in this, but uh, there's a piece of detail that people probably need to hear. So there was this famous um, battle in, in pre-South African history where um, these Dutch pioneers had fled from the Western Cape and moved in, uh, into the, what was the hinterland. And that is where they encountered these African tribes. So they encountered the, the Zulu nation. So you may have heard of the Zulu people. They are a very proud martial um, culture. And um, so, so there was an encounter between the white uh, pioneers and, and the Zulus who were in their settled uh, um, lands. And um, a war, a, a battle, there's this famous battle, it's called the Battle of Blood River. It happened on the 16th of December. This was all drummed into me as a, as a primary school student. And um, the, um, some, in the order of 10,000 Zulu Impi attacked a, um, a Afrikaner, Dutch Afrikaner camp encampment um, with ox wagons, which is a bit like your wagons that people pioneered west, but instead of using horse-drawn wagons, they used oxen um, okay. because the terrain was rocky and rougher and things proceeded fairly slowly. Um, and so Boers had horses, uh, but um, the oxen were used for these wagons. So there was, um, so 600 odd people were attacked by 10,000 uh, frontline warriors uh, uh, who, who had basically, con you know, decimated the local tribes and they ruled the roost, the Zulus did. And um, the about 5,000 Zulus died and, and one of the Boers was lightly injured in the leg right at the end of the battle when they um, pursued the fleeing Zulu Impis. Um, and prior to this, this encounter, um, a, pr a, a prayer gathering was held and um, a, a covenant was made with God. And this, this is part of the Afrikaner founding myth, that if they survived this, that they would um, commemorate the day forever and build a church in honor of this. And this, this literally became the day for that, that South African Afrikaner nation was, was founded upon. The, the fact that God chose them over the black heathen and they... Um, and they use that to justify everything after that. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, yeah. So, and this was drummed. I mean, this was drummed into me as a as a young impressionable mind. And um, so, I didn't question any of that when I was in primary school. Um, all I, you know, all I wanted to do was, yeah, do the schoolwork, go back home, and grab my guns, and you know, run around and shoot stuff and have fun. <laughs> um, right. So I didn't question any of this. I had no, re you know, it wasn't in me to question it. I had, I didn't have a questioning approach to life back then, and and then all that changed when I got into high school. Right. Um. So yeah. Anyway, so. Okay. So yeah. So yeah, there's some, there's, I bet there's some interesting dynamics there with, with, you know, how does a church evolve? How does Christianity evolve in the history of it? But I would. Yeah, I guess so. So now I'm going to jump back to, you know, you're, you're listening to these, this biblical series. And basically, you know, the question is like, what if you had had that Jordan Peterson biblical series, uh, whenever you did that six or seven weeks of trying out the Bible, it's like, what, how would that have impacted you to have maybe someone who's, who, yeah, who, who's a little no, bit more, I would have, yeah. I would have had no interest in it. You um, wouldn't have. Okay. No, I don't believe so. Um, so, so, I, as I said to you, I, so I've, I found Peterson. So th look, there's a lot here I'm not telling you. And um, right. I, 
I think with your permission, um, once we know, I, I don't want to waste people's time on stuff that um, are going to seem irrelevant to them. Uh, but once this, pro once this project is demonstrated to be viable, they, they might be more interested in this. So I think okay. we'll, we'll leave a lot of the sort of the background stuff, you know, what these synchronicities actually were, but I'll just state for this moment, these, these synchronicities were, it had a Christian element. So, and a lot of it was, um, so have you heard of Dan Brown's uh, Da Vinci Code? Yes, I read that. I enjoyed okay. it. Okay, right. So, um, so that was um, part of. So, I, I was given this book, and I just gobbled it up because you know it was debunking Christianity, you know, sort of the spiritual aspects of Christianity. Um, so, and it was in my fervor to an enjoyment in reading a you know, debunking of the sort of the spiritual side of Christianity that I got nailed and that I got hooked in. Um, but it was a synchronicity, a series of synchronicities associated with my reading of that book and how it dovetailed with the project um, that um, drew me in. So, right. um, so my first thing that I had to get to the bottom of was, uh, I first had to sort of take the synchronicity, but because Dan Brown's book was linked to the Bible, I had the suspicion that this there was a biblical element. Uh, but I had no, because I was still a pagan, um, and, and I, I see Jungian synchronicities as, you know, they could have a foot in either camp. It could either be pagan or what could be, you know, sort of the, the biblical worldview. It, it, I think it works in both, in both camps. Right. Um, so, so I was still in the pagan camp, but um, but I had this nagging question about the the biblical link to it. And so when Peterson gave a psychological justification for the Bible, he drew me in because he still wasn't, you know, I was with Peterson and yeah, I don't have to accept God is real, but there's something here that works, if you know what I mean. So I got sucked in step by step with Peterson, um, except that I am now a professing Christian where he's, he's not so but you know we're all different so um, such is as as it is and, and that's why I've, and as soon as I ended up at Paul's place I, I found I knew I'd sort of landed it so where I wanted to be I'm guessing I could look it up Dan Brown maybe it was like 20 years ago or something like that uh, so this um, I could look almost 20, uh, 20 years ago so it was the yeah. So I was uh, given the book in late 2003. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, okay. And so since 2003, you started having, um, you, you've, it's like you were either, either being pushed or pulled and you had these little hints and clues dropped along the way. And, and um, you, you, you read it or you encounter Jordan Peterson in the biblical series and you're still, yeah, at that point, you're not a Christian, but soon after yep. that, you become a Christian. And it has something to do with this project that we're working on. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so perhaps, I mean, you keep talking about the project, so perhaps I should just well, say, you just give a little bit of background there. Um, would that make sense or not? Well, I, what, what I think is really cool, and I don't know if you wanted to be bold about it and, and be confident about it but it's like like what what is the goal of this project what what will it do in in the world like what is the what is the kind of the the hope or the expectation about what this project can do in this world that we're in yeah well it, if is i'm that, is, is that a good way to start i mean to me that's what brings in the audience is like here's what we're aiming at right yeah yeah so so there's there's my private goal which i've sort of shared with you a little bit which which i'm not going to share right now because that okay. might just um scare people all um so uh, depends on this corner of the internet they, I don't yeah, know yeah how but, many but it still, scares them or how many would yeah be well it, it's going to make people roll their eyes right so and and i i heard paul vanderclay say you know some yahoo walks in he didn't but some rando walks in off the street and says yeah he's, he's seen the light and he's found the truth He's going to roll his eyes because he's heard this a thousand times. Right. Um, so like me, I say that sometimes. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so I don't want to set the tone with that because then it just, um, I get you. It makes people tune tune out, I believe, uh, because I do the same thing to people and make such claims. It's a very, yeah. uh, it's a very natural response because you know who the hell are you to claim that you know you, you've seen some deep truth. So, uh, setting all that aside, um, so, um, so the, I'm going to uh, how, how shall I put it? So. Um, <laughs> Yeah. So, okay, so, what if I shared? What if I shared like how I view uh, my relationship with this project? That way, I can put myself out there as a crazy person. Okay, <laughs> you go for it, and then I will. Uh, I will um, uh, give you the big thumbs up, or I might add a few <laughs> sentences. Okay. So, um, I, I, yeah. When I encountered Jordan Peterson, I saw someone who um, was saying all the right things, um, and my my. My view of of um, of God hasn't changed much, except that my relationship with God has improved since since I kind of recognized God. And so, yep. Um, eventually, maybe about two years ago, actually, I started um, doing outreach, trying to find people. I mean, you could say I was called to try to connect with people and see if they would have conversations with me in order to participate in the right way of being um it started out on facebook and then you know i would go from a personal relationship like facebook and then i'd go to well maybe i'll shoot i'll try to reach out to the president of the united states and i've been doing this for years you know and it even starts even six years ago and i started doing it more and more and maybe getting better at it and you know eventually I got into the Bridges of Many Discord server, and um, eventually we were connected. Um, I, I had noticed, like, I was trying to connect with people who had these YouTube channels that are in this corner of the internet, and um, I shared, I had tried to create, and the, one of the reasons I'm okay saying I'm, I might be the crazy person is I create, tried to create a perpetual motion machine back uh, out of college. You know, I've made these kinds of mistakes where I, I, I I aimed for something that everyone thought was impossible. I've been willing to do that. And, um, but when I went and did my perpetual motion machine, I, I discovered some interesting patterns and, and I saw that the meaning code channel, Karen Wong in the meeting, meaning code channel was talking with, I think, Mark Lefevre, and maybe it was someone else, but in general, yeah, it wasn't, it was wasn't Mark back, it wasn't it wasn't. back then. <laughs> Yeah, but I've, it might have been a production. There was a guy who works in a shop. Um, I forget his name. I've actually exchanged emails with him, and I think he was on Karen's channel very recently again. So he works he, he works in a shop where they have to custom build items. So, so it's sort of one offs and or small small production runs. So so he he works. I it might have been him. So I remember Karen talking about because she's an artist and she would talk about these patterns in art and she would, and she would explain how the patterns that she would see in doing her art um, could be seen broader in the world. And I was thinking yeah, that really resonated with me because um, I noticed patterns and thought I had perpetual motion, but I did actually notice patterns that can be seen in the world. And so I, I, I created a video and sent it to Karen. And then she said, um, maybe you'd be interested in meeting Jason. So and so eventually, I've, um, Jason and I started talking, and Jason, he um, basically, Karen kind of talked about Jason as the guy who, I forget the way she put it, it's the guy who wants to build a tower that behaves like a giant mountain, right? Something like this. It's, I, I don't remember the exact words. And, the, and, and Karen um, has one video with Jason, but I just figured... I could take my experience of having a big idea get shattered and at least help Jason identify what was wrong with his idea. So, you know, the idea, so I really wanted to save him a lot of trouble because I didn't yeah. have that. I spent two years with my idea and nobody could tell me what was wrong with it. So I said, I'll just try to work with Jason to help him see um, if there's anything that's wrong with his idea. And, you know, what I found is that um, the idea seems to work the physics of this idea and the project that I'm just trying to help with and be of service with, 
I found that and I found someone, I found Jason, he's, he's serious about this. Um, and like I've searched for serious people for over two years and Jason's the most serious person on the internet that I could connect with where I could just volunteer. That's willing to talk to you. That's willing to talk to you, right? So low down. Right. Yeah. Well, I'm, you know, I essentially did a process of trying to connect with people and volunteer and yep. see if they ignore me or not. Cause I'm a, I have a set of skills that make me valuable. I mean, I know that and I try to volunteer my time uh, and my skills. And if people ignore this expertise and this value that I bring, then I know they're not serious. And so Jason's the most serious person that I've encountered who um, would be willing to cooperate with um, someone who brings a set of skills um, and, a, and a, a mind that is curious and, and capable of solving problems. It's sometimes slow, but pretty competent. Um, like, and understands the value of doing that, like, which is part of the pattern I saw. And so uh, this project, um, what's interesting about this project and synchronicity in general is that if you go to my blog, like I talk about something called the human resource problem and how if we could just cooperate and organize properly, we could solve world hunger. Um, and, and I had another blog post that's linked to that that talks about in order to solve world hunger, we need to make sure we can provide clean water for everyone on the planet. Like that would, so these things are interconnected. We need to be able to cooperate and organize effectively and we need to be able to uh, produce provide clean water for the world and we, these problems are solvable and it turns out that this project that where i built a website for jason i took his like google doc or the microsoft document proposal and i just attempted to transfer it to a website um this project and the the and the website describes a system that um, can be placed in many different places around the world. It's a, it's a huge tower, right? The bigger, the better, that will um, extract uh, moisture in the air and cause, cause precipitation, right? And that this, this tower can be built in a desert and can extract moisture out of the air and create precipitation. And then you can, you can actually grow food. And so it's a, and it's a, it's a novel idea. It's, it's novel in the sense that humans haven't um, encountered this idea yet. Like, and, um, or I should say, but it uses the principles of nature, right? So it's not like violating anything that's in nature. So that's, so the project itself, it has something to do with this. I see it as having something to do with being able to, um, <laughs> first of all, I've aimed for peace on earth. And I noticed that in order to have peace on earth, you need to cooperate and you need to have clean water. And so this project to me is connected to those things. And it just so happens that more synchronicities happened. And, you know, we talked about having a prize, <laughs> um, trying to get people that we, the idea was that we would just give someone a $400 prize if they can disprove this idea that the physics just don't work. And then soon after that, Elon Musk created a prize for this carbon capture X prize. So it turns out that, you know, when you grow plants in the desert, you can capture carbon in these, in this carbon matter, and you can then enter into a prize to solve this problem that the world's, this is, this is the story, the narrative that, that people are trying to say is like, we need to solve climate change. Well, it just so happens that Jason was, um, I think he might say given an idea for a project. And I was connected with Jason to just help, you know, increase the visibility of this project um, that this thing can also solve climate change even though we weren't aiming at worrying about climate change and the, the way i would describe it with the climate change was that it's it's more like a um, this is a means by which you can make the climate more predictable so just like you can make the climate inside your home more predictable these towers can be built such that you can make the climate of regions throughout wherever these towers are, it makes it more predictable. It makes the supply of water more predictable. So, and, and uh, so, yeah, that's how I would describe the project from my perspective and, and why I, I get excited about it. Yep. So, um, well done. You uh, spoke very clearly for must have been at least 10, 15 minutes. And um, it, it's, uh, 
pretty much laid it all out there. Um, so th there's a, and I don't know the, this, this, um, as you asked me to describe this thing, and there's this word that uh, another um, member of our group uh, has also used, and so him and I have spoken a bit about it, um, and the word is to terraform. Um, so this project of ours is really, is, uh, I think one way to describe it, it, it is a system to terraform uh, a local environment. Um, but ultimately, if you put up enough of them, you can terraform the planet. Um, in the sense, as, as you said, it makes um, conditions more predictable. Um, so it directly events. So it's, this is a, um, it, it, it basically runs off the temperature difference between the um, ground level temperature and temperature at altitude. Um, so we won't bore you with those details, but there's a temperature difference the higher up you go um, from sea level. Um, and it, it, so it runs off, off it, so the, the energy for the system is provided by that temperature difference. Um, and it uses that process to cool the air, which allows water to condense out of it. And that's the source of the water. But the, this thing gives us, um, it does a couple of things. So this tall tower vents a lot of surface heat, which is the energy that runs it. In the process, it delivers, um, it cools the air um, in the bottom half of the structure and the heat is vented in the top half. And through that cooling process, we get the water condensate being produced just like an air conditioner would, um, or you take a cold beer out of the fridge and stand it on the counter. It doesn't take long for water to start beating on the outside. So it uses that very basic concept to cool moisture out of the air and even in the Sahara there's a um, relative humidity of 25 percent so even in the Sahara there's moisture in there it just never gets cold enough or almost never gets cold enough for it to rain with this system you can achieve that cool. the other thing that it does is it produces very cold air in the core in the center of this unit and you've got hot air adjacent to it and you can use the temperature difference between the air in the center of the unit and the ambient air outside to actually generate power. So the, the other thing that it does is it generates power. But um, the terraforming works on that it's venting heat. So the problem with global warming is, is a slow, imperceptible increase in surface level temperature. This thing, one of these structures as we've modeled it vents almost 30 gigawatts of heat continuously day and night. So directly vent surface heat um, a kilometer up into the ground, into the atmosphere. So it's, so it's terraforming in that sense. It's terra uh, in, in the sense that it's um, venting the heat at the surface. So if you is sitting in a, in a warming climate cycle, as the claim is that we now are, it can offset that. However, yeah. if you, um, I'll just finish the thought and then okay. I'll hand it over to you. Um, by extracting moisture from the air in a desert, which is a carbon free environment, is basically wind blown sand. If you can uh, get vegetation to establish there, you, you're now um, bringing carbon dioxide out of the air in the form of plant matter on the ground. Um, and you then if you build enough of these structures and it will take, you know, this is gonna take a couple of hundred years um, to green substantial areas in the Sahara if, if these things are effective and people continue building them, um, you can effectively turn the Sahara under the climate system, you can turn large portions of it green and humid, which I believe climate models will show is if you humidify the Sahara, um, you can also prevent the planet from going into an ice, a cooling cycle or an ice age because deserts get very cold at night because dry air doesn't trap any heat. So all the, the deserts have huge thermal variation with 
um, diurnal thermal variation, which means the daytimes are very hot and the nighttimes are very cold because the air is relatively dry. Um, by humidifying the Sahara, the daytimes are still going to be hot, but we're venting a lot of that surface heat during the day, but we can moderate the amount of venting we do at night. And if you've humidified the, the desert at nighttime, you're trapping a lot of the heat. So if you're in a cooling cycle, we can theoretically, and this, would, this is a this is a very big claim which needs lots of validation, but you can theoretically um, investigate, or you can certainly make the claim and it should be investigated that if say the Australian outback and the Sahara desert are humidified, that I believe that that can prevent an ice age from developing because a lot of heat is exported out of those two large massive land surface areas at night, which it, it, which by modulating how you operate these towers, you can um, prevent that heat es escaping once these areas have been humidified. So how's that for a long word salad? Yeah, the, the, I'm listening to you and I'm, I'm thinking um, uh, the creator created Jason. <laughs> so Jason- Just like he created you. Right. And, um, and so I imagine that, that there are people who could listen to this and some are more interested in these in like your cat and the relationships, yeah. <laughs> you know, and there's some people you, 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 you begin talking about heat pumps in Tasmania and you're talking about these, the, the, the science um, of, of how the, this project would actually do what we think it will do and plan for it to do and hope for mm -hmm. it to do. And, you know, some people would be less interested in that. And, but the beautiful thing is like, God created you and I, and that's, this is how our, our, how we tick. And, yep. um, and um, the hope would be that we are exactly the, the people that would um, get this thing kind of rolling and whatever this thing is like, that's, that's an interesting um, idea. So we, you know, the hope would be that we um, get attention. Um, we, you know, there's two paths, right? Either the idea doesn't work. Someone comes along and says it doesn't work and they can explain why it doesn't work or it does work, right? And so if it does work, um, this is a project that will take decades and it will be one of the largest projects that um, humans have ever <laughs> attempted. Um, it's a very large project. And um, the aim, like, to, for me, I can say like the aim is um, providing for everyone's necessities and aiming at, you know, peace on earth, increasing peace on earth over time. That like, to me, that's the aim. Uh, and it's going to take a lot of work. It's a huge project. Um, I've tried to figure out how it could fail uh, physically. Um, and it seems feasible so long as there is a will and there's enough people who are willing to do this which well, there are I've, people who, who are, who claim to want to do this. Like yep. they want to solve climate change, whether or not you believe climate change is a problem or not. This solution does things like provide clean water, provide housing, provide food, provide, you know, it provides. Um, so this, you know, even if people want to solve climate change, the side effect is going to be, you know, making sure people have food, water, and shelter. Right. So that's pretty, that's yep. pretty cool. Oh, all right, so if I a couple of thoughts bubbled up there. So just on the um, on the on the physics of it, I think it's worth mentioning that um, Carl Gruner, who spoke to Karen very early on in the piece, and there were a couple of conversations where Carl Gruner and Ira Katz spoke. Uh, I think about economic economics. Hayek's model of economics. Now, um, Ira Katz is actually a former professor of fluid mechanics and has um, cast his eye over our proposal and has given it an in principle tick that the, the fluid mechanics works. But just to, um, it's not just my say so, I've had it vetted by. Uh, people with uh, master's degrees in physics and, and 
sort of background in fluid mechanics, uh, they can't fault it. So this has been vetted by, um, so I, I'm a mechanical engineer by training with um, some fluid mechanic knowledge, um, uh, but people with better trained than I have checked it and tried to fault it and haven't been able to do that yet. So just let's put that up there. It's not just some two randos on the internet say so, this has been vetted. So, point. Um, and, and as to our seriousness, I don't think we've actually mentioned that, that we're now officially are a registered team on the Carbon Capture X Prize, uh, sponsored by Elon Musk, who has put up 100 million of his own dollars towards solving this problem. So, you know, he's a serious guy, he's donated money. Um, to the climate skeptics out there, I'm a climate science skeptic. Um, I don't believe we have the knowledge to predict what the cl future climate is going to do. And, and that's why I made the point of mentioning that this can theoretically solve heating and warming if rolled out in sufficient capacity. Um, so I just thought I'd get those. So whether ah, ah, and, and then just one other point, you know, because when people talk about climate change, and I'm one of them, is eye rolling starts to happen. However, if you look at the political cycle around climate change, um, you know, the Biden administration is trying to, uh, they had ambitions for a green, um, uh, what was um, Roosevelt's uh, program called in the 30s? New Deal. And they were looking for a green New Deal. Um, they haven't gotten that yet, but they've got the Build Back Better infrastructure program now, which has got a lot of implications for America's um, future energy use, right? So the policies are being enacted that are changing the way America, and not just America, the whole world are going to interact with the energy systems that we've used in the past, and they are being demonized and we are looking at changing the way we generate power and and whether our project fails or succeeds has no bearing on the current political um, imperative to change to basically change course into the unknown this is happening regardless of what you and i do and what anyone thinks about climate change the politicians the powers that be are currently changing the course of um, humanity's future engagement with energy, regard regardless of what any individual thinks and whether you're bored or excited about climate change, changes are coming because the politicians are passing laws every year to, to, uh, to, to change direction. So we, um, we, we need to throw, we need to engage with this regard regardless of whether you think it's all rubbish or not, um, because the political class are, are, are coming for us. And, um, and, and I look at the, uh, the current suite of energy generating systems that, that have already in use, and it's, I'm talking about solar photovoltaics and wind towers, and, and there's lots of human suffering coming if those are the answers. They cannot work. And I want to know, I want to know uh, what's your cat's name. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to get that's that's, um, <laughs> you know, I'm a, I'm a libertarian. I don't believe in the <laughs> <laughs> My cat hasn't given me permission to declare it. <laughs> the, uh, yeah, it's, it's, I think what's, what's, what I've heard you in our talks before mentioned and it's, it has to do with the synchronicity is that um we i don't think either one of us feel that like the things that we're doing that we want to like take credit for any of that and like we definitely want to um basically we don't want our own glory and we would want to want this to be pointing at at something more important than us and then like i would say i mean you are a christian and so you're pointing probably in that direction and I'm, I believe in God and I'm pointing in that direction. So um, I think on the, this corner of the internet, that's important to point out is that, you know, yeah, we, we're, we're not, 
we're not in, we're not worried about becoming rich or uh or, or you know having more power or more glory and that's something i've been transforming into is uh, i'm at a long like even in the last year i've been coming i've i've been transforming into this way of being um and yeah i look and and when i think you and i've had these discussions privately but um you know we can talk about elon musk and his x prize and that um neither you or i realistically believe we're going to win the prize uh, because the the project is of such a scale that in the time frame available i don't think we can meet the conditions that have been set in order to win the prize in order to demonstrate it but um musk in his launch video with the x prize um, chairman ceo peter diamandis opened up an intriguing possibility that if the right idea came along that was unable to win the prize is that he would look at it if the idea was the right the right idea he, he would he would look at it regardless of the outcome of the x prize um so that and when we look at the um sort of the engineering requirements of the project and everything associated with it i don't believe that there it's realistic to expect personal wealth regard you know even if it has a positive outcome um there's i don't have i don't have any expectations of of uh, of, of you know a, a massive pile of money at the end of it that's not why i'm doing it i'm doing this because i'm now, uh, so the genesis for the idea the seed for this idea um i got back in 1993 so that's how long back this is well, going for me and pre dan brown and, yeah, yeah, yeah pre dan brown so that, that was the engineering genesis of it um so but then uh, you know so I, I was all a flutter about it um and then i was unable to source a critical component which is a rare earth metal called gadolinium it was pre-internet in south africa so I, I i was stuck and then life took over and cool. i was actually in tasmania exploring uh, moving here um when i remembered because i was looking for something to do and then i remembered the idea and then i was with a family member who was able to source them that metal for me and um, and and that's when the, the synchronicities and everything else started but um I mean, yeah, for, right. for, for me, and I think for you, you know, so you, your history online is there for all to see that you've been looking for something to get your teeth into. Well, um, there, it's interesting, like, so imagine this thing works. Um, our stories, they're not, it's like some, a lot of our stories are things that, that um, as a whole, a big story, um, you know, you could say that it was kind of, that we were created in order to become a person who could do a good work. Um, I like to believe everyone's like that. And what's, if you look at the system, you've got an above ground tower that requires people who know something about thermodynamics, fluid dynamics, and uh, refrigeration Const and construction <laughs> and construction. Um, and it also has a component that's underground with geothermal and what's interesting is that you've you've had this experience with as a refrigeration mechanic and before that mechanical engineering and working in mines yeah, like that's a part that we haven't talked about there's a so there's these kind of yeah there's there's like a, a a window of time in your life that is kind of related to and this um the design of the system as a whole which allowed you to actually um be given this idea and so these period this is the things that in, in hindsight um, seem fitting. And then within each moment of time, that seems like there are these synchronicities kind of leading you and pointing you along the way, right? Yeah. Oh, all right. Yep. So, you know, before you, before we started recording this conversation, we were just talking about subconscious mental processes and all of that, because when I had the revelation, which occurred in late 20, I want to say 2019 or was it 2018 time? I think it was late 2019. Um, and shortly thereafter, I had, so had a very garbled, I had a very garbled talk with Karen where I was making, you know, I was tr trying to create a word picture of this complicated system. And I, you know, I, I um, it, it was a mess, but um, that, 
<laughs> what is intriguing is that I did not, I, at the time when this idea presented itself into my conscious mind, I wasn't thinking about it. It, it was that typical light bulb moment and, and it, integrate, it integrated experiences that I'd had for most of my adult life, knowledge that I'd accumulated. And it's like your, so on one level, you could say your sub, my subconscious mind and anyone's subconscious mind is a supercomputer that is grinding away at problems that we're totally unaware of, right? Because I wasn't consciously aware of that my mind was working on solving this problem. I had no idea. And then the answer popped into my, so, so on one level, then it had taken all this knowledge that I'd built up over the years, including um, you know, work underground and, and the knowledge of how heat, uh, uh, the heat profile on, in, in the planetary atmosphere, you know, sub, uh, subterranean and atmospheric system and how those heat profiles work. Integrated all of that together with my engineering knowledge, my fluid mechanics and my knowledge that I'd and direct embodied experience that I'd had developed as a, as a refrigeration mechanic, which I'd never thought I'd be. I, I, um, it just happenstance. I felt it's a trade that I fell into out of desperation because other yeah, things that I was it, it doing didn't, didn't work. And my wife happened to be working at this company and they happened to need a salesperson. Yeah. And then Michael, who's part of our team, was brought in and he happened to see, oh, Jason looks like a good enough guy. And I was offered the opportunity to move from sales into a technical position, which I grabbed. And, um, and then, yeah, and then Michael and I got involved in a, um, we've actually got a, a patent for a system to improve the performance of a heat pump. And that knowledge that we accumulated in developing that patent um, which can be found with the search online with our names. Um, <laughs> that knowledge uh, of moving heat into water was critical towards uh, this big aha moment. Right. Now, I, I'll, I'll just, so, so that's the physicalist interpretation of what happened. As I had a, another garbled talk with Karen in, a, in an unpublished video where I made the claim that um, all, all this knowledge that I accumulated gave me the language to understand the concepts, but then an angel spoke to me and whispered the answer in my ear. And because I'd now accumulated the knowledge, it was the angel that presented the answer. And I now had the, the mental capacity to understand the answer because I'd had all the personal experiences. So that's, that's the Peugeotian, um, uh, if, if you want, description of the mental aha moment. Yeah. And the way that it occurred is, and I said this to Karen Wong, the way that it occurred is I'm convinced it's the, it's the Peugeotian answer is closer to the truth than the physical side. And when you tie it in with all these synchronicities and everything else that led up to it, every single critical event in leading up to this process and that kept me engaged over decades were these whispers of the new, the whispers be, of the invisible. Um, that, that's what kept me engaged. And that's why I'm now, I, I, and I can't deny that there's an invisible realm uh, where that is communicating with us. I accept that fully. And that's, that's what eventually led me to Christianity as, as having to accept that it's all true. The, the, um, you said the Pajoian truth is closer than, than the physicalist truth or what, how, what did yeah, you say? Yeah. Yep. Okay. So, so, so the sort of the physicalist worldview is that, you know, you, you, you encounter a problem, you can't solve it. And then they tell you to go and sleep on it. And then your subconscious mind, you know, miraculously, whilst you're not expending any extra energy or knowingly working on the problem, it's, it, it solves the problem for you. Um, right. So that's, and, and I might be way off base here, maybe that's not what they claim, but that's sort of how, how I've interpreted the physicalist view of, yep, your subconscious mind will okay. solve the problem. Just sleep on the problem and you'll get the answer. Right? Well, it's a lot of times like a, 
like a, a, a scientism view would be a yeah they they just kind of ignore <laughs> they're ignorant of the of the way that everything is working right we, we obviously are because we're humans yep. so you can then create a word like the unconscious or you can create a word yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Like we create labels synchronicity and, right yeah you can, or even gravity so we create these words oh. for these things that you can't see and yep and then my we favorite think, word oh, we understand it <laughs> my favorite word for the um existence of consciousness is, is emergence so you talk to a physicalist and, and they say well explain consciousness no no it's emergence and that like that's answer you know there you trying go. to word it i've got a word no, for it's you. answered now it's emergence yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, there you I'm, go well, next I'm, question <laughs> i know the truth um, yes the what's interesting to think about that is well what if you had become the uh the pastor at the dutch reformed church right it's like we wouldn't be here now <laughs> like like so in a way i guess my point is like your atheism and your paganism it all kind of lent toward uh, where you're at now yeah i mean it's it's um yeah that's the funny thing when you're sort of 57 years old and you look back on your life and you and, and you think well if i'd changed this one thing back then where would i be now you know you'd presumably be a totally you'd be a somewhat different person and you'd be physically probably located somewhere else i guess so i guess my um, point is the pastor wasn't going to be given an idea for this for this system no right because he correct because he didn't have the language. He, he, he wouldn't have the means to comprehend to decipher the pattern right yeah and so yeah that to me that's i've got um when i try to imagine the creator creating the most beautiful creation possible um you can there's these um so the fractal patterns and then like your your life story is itself it a pattern and then within each moment a pattern and then my story is in parallel and then our cooperation can form a pattern and i think like i even this is where you know i diverge from christianity is like i even see the different religions um uh, being part of the pattern part of something very important for the creator to do the creation that is most beautiful thing that could yeah yeah, yeah. So, so so you know a culture that has lasted for thousands of years i'm not going to dismiss their religion I, i'm not dismissive of it i'm saying that it's that culture stands on a mountain that is not quite as tall as the judeo-christian mountain that's but there's a mountain there and you have to pay it respect well, um it's interesting between you've got the you've got a religion that's really old you could say like judaism and then you've got christianity that's got um it's younger built on the old but it's an, but it's an extension of it huh? well then you have islam that's a it's even an extension on christianity to a degree and and then so like the religion that's not a religion that's maybe being created now that hasn't been named you know it might be an extension on that as well uh yeah yeah look i'm um i'm not trying to convert you obviously no no no, no. i mean i'm a, um i i'm dying to but 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 i'm restraining myself from walking <laughs> through that door that you're just trying to open <laughs> because i've i think it's going to create eye rolls and etc cetera, etc cetera. yeah um however i am i'll tell you what if we um get positive traction through this X-Prize process and it starts looking like you. you get a lot of credible eyeballs on us and a lot of credible talking heads start liking our idea before the X-Prize is finished I'm walking through that door I've, I've, had, I've, I've spoken to you about doing it and then not doing it and then doing it again you know in our private conversations and I'm going to uh, my current thing is it's got to happen before the completion of the prize but but the time can only happen is when the secular experts start getting excited about it and concur that this this works right. on paper right because you know only after the x-prize is finished or one of these things presumably be built if, if it's ever going to get built
So I understand that there's a, um, you want, you, sometimes things are so, um, grandiose that, you know, uh, that, and there's also this awareness of the audience and, um, you don't necessarily want to just, it might not be productive to share everything right now, but you could share everything at a later date such that you might not seem like some kind of a delusional person. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I'm looking for, um, so I, I suggested early on that there was a two track process to the synchronicity. There was the spiritual aspect directly coupled with the scientific slash engineering thing. And, and the two, supported each other and they were at the the um the uh progression of the scientific knowledge that underpinned this idea was directly coupled with uh, the um with the synchronistic revelatory and dream experiences that i had um so i'm not going to bore people with those those details but the two were coupled so in order for me to have credibility at the end of this process i need to be come clean on the spiritual aspects uh, once people are prepared to accept that the physical aspect is is looking good right because up until then it's just two you know two randos on youtube you know right. shooting our mouths off so so i need to gain credibility in order for people to be prepared to listen to me and take me seriously in the second one but it needs to happen beforehand so that I can say, I didn't dream this up post factor. Right. That I'm, and I'm putting my head on the chopping block and I can be mocked and laughed or whatever prior to this thing finally being accepted as real. So that's, that's sort of my strategy. I, I, I want to do it before the final uh, acceptance, if it's ever going to happen. Well, but, I we, need to, but I need to do it, yeah. Um, if, Here's the, if we were to do it, say, if we were to try to do it right now, how long would it take for you to kind of uh, to provide that information? Okay, so I'd probably have to spend several weeks of my spare time um, doing, you know, the work we've done on the um, GIFs and animations and drawings on our blog, I'd, uh, on our website, I'd have to do, I'd have to take that stuff and then re reorientate it towards the, the spiritual thing. So I'd take those, those physical patterns and I, and I'd transpose biblical and Genesis patterns onto them, which is right. why the Genesis is, is critical to the story and, and why Peterson's and Peugeot's latest video with Peterson on the Young Society, that pattern um, maps perfectly onto this yeah. pattern. So that's, okay. a, so, that's a hint. Yeah. hint. Like a hint, hint. Right? Yeah, hint, hint, hint. So yeah. I'm going to be bringing a lot of Peugeot's work into it. Um, so it's mainly going to be, it's going to be all Peugeot. Peugeot's pattern, pattern, pattern is going to be mapped onto the physical components of this thing, but I need to take those drawings out, relabel it, and then give the biblical citations and passages so I can walk you through it and show you that the patterns match. Um, right. And, and it's just to pique people's interest is... Um, you know, the Bible is about repeating patterns and we're talking about going out into the desert with a tent-like structure that, and we're going to get water. So there's, how's that for a biblical pattern? Um, another, ex, another great exodus. So I'll just leave that hanging. Just, yeah, but, I mean, but, but anyway, that's the, that's the pattern we're looking at. But this thing, need, you know, people are just going to close, their eyes are going to close up and they say, yada, 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 you know, it's just two randos talking on the internet. So we need to get some credibility behind the, the design concept before anyone's well, going to take this seriously. That would be, it might be, you know, I'm not even, um, I'm in, I am definitely into uh, being able to identify and recognize patterns. And I'm into this idea about time as we know it isn't. Um, isn't isn't um the time the way time works uh for most people and the way people assume time works is wrong right there's a, yeah. like these there's a there's an amount of like predictability uh in existence um 
and so yeah I'm, I'm definitely willing to to like learn about these patterns and 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 learn and i mean they're either true or they're not true right they either work or they don't work and so sure they should i guess the claim is that these patterns will increasingly be revealed there'll be a revelation about the truth of these patterns and how they operate in the world and yep. they and then those patterns are embodied within um I would say if they truly are throughout everything, they're embodied within every cell all the way up to every layer of being within the human and within organizations of humans and everything that we're creating, and including the, this project that we're working on, but yeah, including, yeah, yeah, including yeah, all yes. other projects as well. Correct. Correct. Um, um, so so I, I'll agree with everything you said. The, um, it would be interesting if if... Like it would be really interesting if 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 this thing gets to a point where people are saying, "Yeah, this will work." If at that point you were able to just to have that conversation with um, like Jonathan Pajot. Yeah. So let's um. Okay, we, we, we're speculating now, so let's speculate <laughs> a little bit further. So. You know, I've no, no idea when our credibility is going to rise, but there's one potential point at which we're going to gain credibility. So there's in this X prize schedule, there's a um, interim prize, uh, which will be announced in April next year. Right? And there's 15 prize winners. Now, if there's something like 4,600 X prize entrants. Um, in Tasmania alone, there's so I've registered our team in my hometown, but you're in Alabama. I won't say what city you're in. You're in Alabama and I'm in Tasmania. Um, and uh, But as the sort of team founder, I've registered it. Yeah, and there's another down south in Tasmania. There's another, there's another X-Prize. So on the little old island of Tasmania with the half a million people, we've got two X-Prize entrants. The US has just got... I don't know, a thousand. Um, it's so, so there's a lot of competition, but I, I think a bunch of those entrants aren't serious, but there's some very serious entrants and there's a lot of money and we have nothing. We're a bunch of randos with a great idea and limited means to, um, to do a full, uh, no means to do a full demonstration, but we have, we've charted a, a course to actually demonstrating all the concepts in this idea, right? So we've spoken about that privately. We're not going to broadcast all that now because no one would be interested. But um, if we win an interim prize in April next year, then I'm talking about because then we're on the map. Once we're on the map, so if an expert panel rec recognizes our um, thing as viable enough to throw a million dollars at our team, we've got an attention. All right. And then I'm talking about, then if you're willing to um, uh, have another one of these conversations, but it's going to be having watched me speak over the, over the year that we've done and watched my video with Karen Wong, we're going to have to, um, yeah. Are we going to have to do a Van der Kleyen length uh, expose on this? Because it's going to, I reckon it's going to take a couple of hours and we may have to, do it over a couple of weeks just to keep everybody fresh. Yeah. And then and then you can stitch them together and you know and maybe release. I don't think you should release them one by one. You should probably release two or three videos, however long it takes. But it's it's yeah. gonna happen. Uh, and then I would like for Joe to have a listen to that and see if he wants to uh test me on uh, you know, and and we we presumably have a way of getting it to him, whether he then takes the trouble to look at it or not, is you know, the, uh, un unknowable. Yeah, I guess the question would be, is like, a, yeah, people are treating Jonathan Pajot as, as some kind of an expert on the symbolic world. And then um, there's, and then Jason is seeing things um, that, that are symbolic and you would wanna uh, see if, if, if uh, if Jonathan Pajot and Jason are seeing kind of the same thing or seeing something different. Uh, but yeah, the, what's the due date? When, when do we get to uh, then get, the, um, get your take on the symbolism uh, that brings uh, what we're doing and the project we're working on 
I mean, integrates it with scripture. Well, what, um, that date? Do you know it? So it, it's Earth. So the um, this uh, interim prize results gets announced on Earth Day next year, which is sometime in April. I forget. I don't know the cool. exact date, but it's. I, I think it's. I think it's just after Easter. Yeah, it's just it's usually around April 19 or April 20 yeah. or something like that. Yeah, somewhere on there. So, but the, but that's only if we win the interim prize, um, it, uh, which when we look at the amount of work that we have to submit, um, we're going to have to, uh, yeah, um, uh, we're going to have to, uh, January is going to be a busy month for us, I, I suspect, in terms of just putting everything together in terms of a formal proposal. In the meantime, uh, the Tasmanian uh, subgroup of the team <laughs> has got some we've got some experiments to 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 uh to conduct to um prove progress in our in our work so um yeah and and we'll hopefully get it done in december um or very early january um it would be it'd be pretty cool if there was um someone in our network that that has designed and built um, large structures that are over three, four hundred meters tall. <laughs> who, who would be, you know? Yeah, yeah, wouldn't that be cool? Yeah, that but would you be know, cool. um, I do have access to this guy at the University of Tasmania, who's in the architectural field. Who knows? Maybe he has a um, someone in his network that um, can hmm. uh, can join us. But you know, once we've um, once we've on the map. I don't think we're going to have any problem finding yeah. the necessary uh, team members to, um, to take us from, from the interim prize uh, through, through to the final demonstration. Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering if there's a, a, like if you were going to do a prayer for uh, someone who could, could be of help in order to get that, um, to, to get that interim prize in April, um, would it be the kind of person who can, who can actually design and build and lay out a plan for this giant structure? That, like, would that be of help in order to win that? Or is that something that we could do without that person? And, and um, would... Yeah, look, I could do um, material sizing. So I, I worked for several years as a um, pressure vessel design engineer and also stru uh, structural design codes um so the american society of mechanical engineers and british standard codes for structural and pressure vessel and both of those knowledges would be pertinent to this because you're talking about tall pipelines um under under high pressure so i've and i've still got the manuals here in I from you. back in the day and I, I still remember most of those design formulas so it's fairly straightforward and I'm not, you know, and that'll give us a ballpark, you know, we're in, we're in the right sort of, okay. <laughs> we're in the right hemisphere sort of um, solution, yeah. um, which is all that's required for, for well, this. But, but it would, you know, there's, there's aspects that I know nothing about or very little about um, because I, we did do even, um, you know, in refinery design, we were exposed to wind loadings of uh, tall, because if you've ever driven past a refinery, you know, there's very tall, cylindrical structures uh, in refineries and, and um, uh, furnaces with, with very tall flues and whatnot. And those things all had, was, had to be subject to wind loading designs and that sort of thing. Um, so I've got, but I don't have those standards at my fingertips. That was all in-house in the refinery and the structure we're building, nothing I learned would, would allow me to model that um so yeah there we would need some outside expertise okay um yeah the uh the, what's there's that i don't know how good of a job i did in, in this conversation but i know that there it's it's impossible for me to actually understand all the experiences and knowledge and expertise that you've gained throughout your life and it, it is um but yeah so i probably didn't do the best job but but yeah it was this was fun just yeah just, I learned a little bit more about at least like a your childhood. I thought that was interesting um, because, so, so, because it, yeah. yeah. So what I didn't mention, so I think I mentioned that I grew up on a farm. So that, and then I actually gave up my engineering profession to go back to the farm. Um, 
so you know and in, intriguing me a, a sort of a vague knowledge of agriculture and how to make stuff grow is also part of the project right because we're looking at um at, at uh, you know transforming a, a barren yeah. landscape in, in into a vegetated area um so it, yeah it's just weird when you look at the whole gamut of knowledge that i have it all it's I'm, I'm struggling to find what what isn't being you know required because um but similarly with you you're going to find that the further this project progressions that and it's not because you don't have to go woo woo or anything like that it's just this project is so big it encompasses so many aspects of um human experience that pretty much everything's relevant right um i think is probably the 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 healthy way of looking at this um, right yeah there's so. going to be a, there's something like city planning and every aspect of 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 life and, and knowledge that is important for life and i guess the right yep. phrase is life sciences it's like everything is included <laughs> yeah yeah i mean we, we're essentially talking about moving cities from the ground up into the sky and plonking them in the middle of the desert right and then saying there you go go and thrive um <laughs> large large uh <laughs> large endeavor requires a lot of expertise that yeah, yeah, yeah where you couldn't find it all in like a single person but yeah correct correct but um i mean i've always for some re reason i've just been fascinated by israel's history and i've read fictional books about it and and i've seen and interact with some people who've worked on kibbutzes there it's actually my brother-in-law has um, done that and my wife's been to, to israel and all of that but um the um yeah the, 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 those early pioneering days you know, are going to there's obviously a lot of cultural knowledge in israel which is going to be pertinent and can be brought to bear when one of these things is actually built and you're out in a desert in a desert barren landscape to, to turn it from you know a wilderness a dead wilderness into into a life-sustaining environment is something that israel has actually done through, through their history so there's be a lot of knowledge in that um, culture as well so. yeah they they have a culture that has seems to have lasted a long time and um and had success right they, and so well they've they've persisted they have persisted right um and uh they every time people want to write them off they just bounce back and here we are we're still here don't get rid of us and they're awesome right yeah god yeah. created the, them as well oh yeah and the right. the um yeah he's favored them with lots of suffering <laughs> um, and he's one could argue is he's forged something mighty and something very small um, yeah because that's in a sense that's what suffering does right it forges you right i agree the uh and yeah imagine like when you had the experiences of the you know throughout life there are times where you experienced you know discomfort pain suffering and then it, it basically paved the way for you to get into the next phase which you know all builds up and oh, yeah, an election yeah, yeah. of um, experience so yep i mean it's i've i um may even have teared up very briefly at karen wong's video but i mean this the, the inspiration for the started when i was sort of in the depths of despair after having sort of given up life on the family farm which had been my dream for my whole life prior to that um so yeah <laughs> yeah yeah i mean so it's in a sense you you get remade when you're in despair um because that's you, you're right at the bottom of the mountain again and you have to start on another yeah on another path basically um, so you, you kind of get you get you somewhere else really humbled <laughs> right. oh yes and and th the strange thing is when you are humble you're open and when you're prideful nobody can tell you anything because you yeah. know it all don't you <laughs> um so so humbling is is necessary to open you up yeah it i agree goes with the territory um 
So, yeah. Well, I'm going to um, stop the recording and yep. let's see. Yeah, let's uh, let's just call it for the week. Uh, we discussed the project beforehand and, and did a little bit of the more serious conversation there. And so just, um, yeah, keep me keep me updated with news. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, the um, experiments. We should um, upload some pictures um, to the Discord. Um, and uh, yeah, um, I, I'm pretty confident we're going to have uh, some uh, good final results for our testing on the weekend and basically um, declare ourselves ready to um, to go and launch our helium balloon with our, with our experimental box slung below. So, um, yeah, I just like I just wanted to say again, like I don't know, I've said it before, I think, but you know, I'm it's amazing and I'm grateful. Like this process of going out and trying to find people who are serious, um, I, me trying to be serious about what I do re trying to offer those services to other people who are serious about what they're doing and then um yeah this is it's really cool that you know you the tasmanians they um that y'all have this expertise to be able to run these experiments and and solve these problems that i wouldn't have been able to solve um, and similarly i get to you know solve problems uh, with a website well uh, that, yeah, that yeah you guys wouldn't have been able to solve so it's it's no no sure we, and, uh, We've I mean, had some you, animations you, uh, from from Carl. There's, so it's it's so cool to see people volunteering their time um, and their expertise and their knowledge and being able to cooperate. And so I hope this thing works out well. But it's 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 a privilege yeah. and it's definitely uh, meaningful. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, neither you nor I've spoken to Carl briefly on the phone, and I've never met the guy, Michael. Michael um, has spent a lot of face time with him. Um, and Carl just pitched in, and you know, uh, how many hours of work he he must have put in into those uh, animations? It's just, um, it's just awesome. And um, you know, so but you know, you, you mentioned um, you know how long we've been speaking together. Sorry, I, I know you need to go, but I just I, think, I think this is necessary to say. Up, yeah, <laughs> so yeah, I, I think time. this is necessary to say is that you know although. Um, this is sort of my idea. What was really cool is that we actually originally met by interacting with your perpetual, you know, with your your idea with an energy storage device. Um, um, so it, it was just crazy. How I just thought, oh, this is pretty cool. But um, what we needed was somebody like you who could, you know, um, uh, do the web presence. And I mean. You've been talking to me for since January, but I've been talking to you. I haven't been sitting here thinking, oh, you know, I've got, I wish I could talk to Michael, who's more important for the project. I was talking to you because you're critical to this process. Without you, we'd have no web presence. We'd have, we wouldn't be able to enter the X Prize without you. So I'm just pointing that out. But you're a vital part of the team. So I yeah, just, that. just in case you're feeling, like you're you're a spare wheel as i said to you this is this project is going to um and it's going to need more team members who are going to bring strengths to this that neither of the current lot have the, yeah the, i wrote yeah. i wrote a song and in that song there's a there's one verse that says uh, little things are big things part of a miracle and yeah. so like there can be like you have the right intentions and and try to participate in the right way and you do something like um just start talking to someone and listening to someone and trying to help someone on the other side of the planet or be able to take the thing that you've practiced and, and create an animation it's there's no telling how how much impact that has in the grand scheme of things like uh, so uh, yeah but a, a, a proper functioning system just like a proper functioning team every component has to contribute or there's or there's cool. something missing and, and the outcomes is, is um, less than what what is necessary or desired right so um, well i do think like in a system there is a there's this thing called like a, a like a bottleneck right or a, yep you have a in a in a chain of events you have a bottleneck or a critical point or you might have the weakest yep. thing. and so you know i don't 
I don't see myself as a, a bottleneck and I'm grateful for that. And, you know, our Carl, who did some animations, he's, he's not a bottleneck and I'm, he didn't, I'm sure he didn't want well, to. He, he solved the bottleneck, right? <laughs> right. He, he unplugged the bottleneck. Yeah. And that's um, the thing is if you come in yeah. and you just try to add something of value with your expertise and knowledge, you can, you might, yep. um, it could, there could be other bottlenecks that get, um, that get solved that are really important right so now yeah. Yeah, when i share the website uh, there's an animation that someone might see and say well that's interesting you know so it's uh, whereas the the same set of eyeballs that may be really important they wouldn't have been captured by the uh, animation so yeah uh, yeah i don't i think those little things can be really important and we don't even know how important they are so correct correct you never know what catches someone's attention right right never know and you can't predict it. You just can't predict it. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I mean, our website isn't perfect because that there's a descriptive element which involves me. So I'm pointing at myself. There's a, there's a flaw which I've spoken to you about before, which needs to be rectified. So I know it's not perfect, but yeah. I'm pretty happy with what we've got. And, and Karen has actually looked at it and expressed herself. She made some suggestions, which we made the changes that you suggested so yeah. getting getting um, constructive criticism is welcome by anybody and everybody um and we take it seriously as we did with, with karen's suggestions and karen was having been on this from the ground floor um, she was the one that originally gave me a voice um and she's been great yeah um, yeah the, so. the karen karen um she had said something in a comment like it's Sometimes I wonder if, if what I'm doing means anything. And then I get a, I get a link like this. And so I yeah. shared a link where we had talked about Karen. And so um, that's, that is, that's awesome as well. Whenever you're able, you're able to receive that feedback about um, how your contributions ended up being really helpful. Sometimes you don't get that feedback and it's nice to have faith. Um, sometimes you get it and it can be really rewarding. So. Well, how, how about I make a suggestion to you if you don't, regardless of whether you publish this video or not, if you want to clip this little section where we thank Karen, clip that and send it to her to as a little private message. I think she, yeah, uh, I don't watch every video she produces, but I do, <coughs> I, I do watch some of them and I, I'm always keeping an eye on which next interesting guest she's going to talk to. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. I think that the end here is, uh, you know, it's, it's basically kind of a, an expression of gratitude and, and yeah. also an invitation to participate as well. So, um, but yeah, <coughs> we, you know, definitely I'm grateful and I'm grateful for the people who have, who have contributed. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it, I think Sorry, it's very, uh, very helpful. Um, my throat's closing up here for some reason. <laughs> So All now right. would be a good time to terminate the conversation. <laughs> I need to go and get some water. <laughs> I'm right, rendered Jason. speechless. All right. Have a good <laughs> just, um, sorry, Gavin. Um, just maybe if you want to end the recording quicker. Yeah, I'll end it.